As we begin, let me pray for you and pray for your family, whether you're at home or on the road, wherever you're at. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your hand of blessing and protection upon every family of Faith Christian Center in St. Paul's. I thank you that no weapon formed against us will prosper. I plead the blood of Jesus over every family of the church and of the school. And I thank you that no plague, no pestilence, no sickness, no disease, no virus will come anywhere near any of our families, not even remotely close. And we give you all the praise, the credit, and the glory in Jesus' name, amen. And remember, as pastor's been teaching us, one of the confessions to make is that you already have immunity from every plague, from every pestilence, and from this virus. So confess that you have immunity, that you believe you receive it, and you have it by faith in the name of Jesus. Now, as we begin, people have asked me, they've said, Austin, in these days, how are you praying for our nation? How are you praying for the president and those in leadership? How are you praying for your family? How are you praying for our church family? And so as we begin, I want to address that and share that with you so you can adjust and make the adjustments you need in your prayer time each morning. And you might ask, Austin, why do you and pastor refer to praying in the morning? Well, it's better to pray before you start your day. And David and others in scripture spoke of praying early in the morning. Pray before the day begins, get the victory, and force the victory before your day begins. In these days, we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. And I'm going to give you some passages to stand on in your prayer time for our nation and some passages to be mindful of when you pray. The first is 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you have to remember that Paul was writing to Timothy during a time of persecution. Paul was writing to Timothy during a time when Christians were being persecuted for their faith. Men, women, children, families were being put to death for their faith. So no matter what's going on, we have to be thankful that we live in the United States of America. Most of us, and I know there are probably people watching in other states, but a lot of us, we live in Texas, so we're blessed. So we have to keep a right perspective and a right attitude. 2 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 1, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. Now notice Paul says for everyone. So it's not just praying for the people you like. It's not just praying for those that you voted for. It's praying for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. God wants all men and women to be saved and to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. So pray for our leaders. Pray that they would have wisdom. Wisdom is the big issue. And so when you pray for the president and those advising him, in whatever state you live in here in Texas, we're praying for Governor Greg Abbott every day. When you pray for the governor and those advising him, pray that they would have wisdom. When you pray for your county, you know, we live in Tarrant County, when you pray for your county, when you pray for the mayor of the city that you live in, for the city council, pray that they would have wisdom. Pray that every advisor who would give wrong advice or wicked advice or factually or statistically wrong advice or any advisor that would give advice but they have a conflict of interest, whatever it is, at every level, pray that those people would be removed from their positions whether it's at the White House, whether it's at the state level of whatever state you live in, whether it's at the county level or the city level, pray that anyone that would be giving wrong advice for whatever reason, that they would be removed from their position. This is important. We need to pray that our leaders would have wisdom, godly counsel, and the right advisors. Let me give you some scriptures. Proverbs 15 and verse 22, it says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. 
And we need to pray that our government leaders would have advisors not just from the field of medicine, but from the field of business and every sector of American life because these decisions they're making, they're affecting every area of American life. Proverbs 24 and verse six, for waging war you need guidance and for victory many advisors. And remember as we learned yesterday in the Sunday morning messages, the fight we're fighting is the good fight of faith. We're not fighting people. So people aren't the problem, principalities and powers are the problem. Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, 12, going to read it out of the King James, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places in DC, high places in Austin, high places here locally, and so we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. So we've gotta pray. We've gotta pray for our leaders, We've got to pray that they would have wisdom. We, got, we have to pray that they would receive godly, sound counsel, factual, correct information. And anyone trying to plot, scheme, connive, twist information, or advancing an agenda, that they would be removed from their place. Another passage to be mindful of when you pray for our nation is 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. And in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, the prayer is, the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, and we learned two Sunday mornings ago that we need to pray that a spirit of humility would come upon our nation and the leaders of our nation from the White House to the State House. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, our nation and our leaders, they need great humility. So we need to pray for that. If they will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We need to pray for humility. We need to pray for repentance. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So we've got to pray that there would be a spirit of humility come upon our nation, that our leaders would repent of pride and arrogance and a lack of humility. We need to pray that America would, would turn to God and repent and turn from wickedness and that God would forgive and heal our land. So pray daily. Let's join together. Not just pastor and me, but all of us together. Pray daily for our nation. Pray daily for our leaders. And also pray daily for us. You know, every day we pray for you. Pray for us. Pray daily for your family. Pray daily for the needs of others. Be mindful of those you know, and this has affected them. Pray for them. Pray for the meeting of their needs. And then pray daily for those that are in the church and they serve in the medical field or in law enforcement or in government in some capacity. Pray for them. Pray that they would have wisdom. Pray for their safety and their protection. And these are some other important passages to renew your mind to and to use in your confession and prayer time in these days. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So don't pray in fear. Don't pray in worry. And that's why you've got to turn the news off. That's why you might have to unfriend or unfollow some people on Facebook. You know, this week at Faith Christian Center, we're learning how faith works. Well, faith comes by hearing the word. And there are some preachers and they're preaching more conspiracy theories than the word. Well, if you listen to all that, it's going to fill you with fear and worry and doubt and unbelief. So you got to turn that off and you've got to tune into the Word of God because it's on the basis of God's Word that we can pray, that we can get answers, that we can have the victory, that we can have every need met. And when the world is full of fear, we can be full of the peace of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So you might say this at home, wherever you are, if you can, say, say I'm not afraid. We're, we're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are of those who believe and are saved. So don't pray full of fear or worry or anxiety. We just read about humility in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. Con consider also 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So when we pray, the answer is coming. 
One of the ways that I've been praying is that every day the number of these cases and deaths in our country would decrease. And it was in the news this morning that the, the cases, the deaths, the numbers are far under what they projected. Praise God for it. So we've got to keep praying. And it says that he'll lift us up. The Lord will lift us up in due time. Verse 7, cast all your anxiety, every care, every anxiety, every worry, cast them all upon the Lord because he cares for you. So when you wake up in the morning, don't, don't check the news before you pray. Now get your Bible and begin praying and pray full of faith, not full of fear, not full of anxiety, not full of worry. Pray also, another passage to pray over your family is Psalm 91. Pray Psalm 91 over your life, your family, and over your church family. Two key verses in Psalm 91 are verses nine and 10. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, no harm will befall you. So you need to pray that and confess that over your family, over your church family, and over your loved ones, that no harm will come near you. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter what's going on in the news. No harm will befall you. No disaster, no trouble will come near your tent. You know, when Christine and I were growing up, every day when my mom drove us to school, she would always pray Psalm 91 over us. And so if you have your Bible with you at home or wherever you are, you can open your Bible to Psalm 91 and let's walk through this and I'll show you how you can personalize it and pray it over your life and over your family. Psalm 91, beginning in verse one, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. So you've got to say, I dwell in the shelter of the most high, I rest, my family rests, my, my children rest in the shadow of the almighty. Verse two, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. So I thank you. you. You pray it. Say, I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are my refuge. You are my family's fortress. We put our trust in you. Verse 3, surely you save us from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. So you can pray, I thank you, Heavenly Father, you save us. You save our family. You save our church family from the fowler's snare, from every trap, from every plot, from every scheme of the enemy. And you rescue us. You save us from any deadly pestilence, any plague any virus. Verse four, you cover us with your feathers and under your wings we find refuge. Your faithfulness is our shield and our rampart. So you, you've got the best protection in the universe, the shield of Almighty God. So thank him that his shield, his rampart, it covers you, your family, your children, your loved ones, your church family. Verse five, you will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day. So thank our heavenly father that you're not afraid you're not living full of fear. Verse six, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. So thank him that you don't fear the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. It's not coming near you. Verse seven, a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. So thank, thank our heavenly father that no matter what goes on in the world, even if a thousand fall at your side, even if 10,000 fall at the right hand of your family, it will not come near you. It will not come near your family, your children, your loved ones, your church family. Verse eight, but you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. So thank our heavenly father that you're not affected, that you only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked, but that it has no effect on you. Verse nine, as I mentioned, if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. So thank him, thank him in the car, thank him in the morning that no, no harm is coming anywhere near you. No disaster is coming anywhere near where you work. No disaster is coming anywhere near your home, your property, the property of Faith Christian Center or St. Paul's. Verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so you will not even strike your foot against a stone. So thank him that you're not even going to strike your foot against a stone. Verse 13, you will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Verse 14, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. So thank the Lord that because you, you love the Lord and who loves God? We find out in 1 John, those who obey his commands, 
So thank God that because you're a doer of the word and you walk in financial covenant with God, that he is rescuing you. He is protecting you and your family because you acknowledge his name. Verse 15, he will call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. So thank the Lord that he's with you, that he's honoring you, that he's rescuing you. He is protecting you. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So thank God that you will be, you and your children, your family, you will be satisfied with long life. Doesn't matter what's going on in the world. You are a child of God and you walk with God. So you're blessed, you're protected. So pray mindful of what the word of God says. Fill your heart with faith, not with fear. Pray mindful of the word. Pray mindful of what 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18 says. For we fix our eyes not on what is seen, what we see with our eyes, what is going on in the world, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What's going on in the news today, it is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Any current circumstances are temporary. So pray accordingly. How do we pray in days of trouble? Philippians 4, beginning in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, which means don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So don't pray full of fear or worry. Pray with thanksgiving. And how can we pray with joy and with thanksgiving? Because God's word is true. God is true. His word is true. And that's all you need to know. So pray with thanksgiving. And in these days, pray mindful of the fact that whatever you're praying about, it could be what's going on in the nation. It could be a need in your family. Whatever you're praying about is temporary. And when we pray, our Heavenly Father hears and answers us. So pray with thanksgiving, knowing when you pray, He hears you, He answers you, and the answer is on the way. So pray mindful of these things. Now I want to encourage you to go back and to listen to or watch the 2018 and 2019 Holy Week revivals and the sessions on prayer from those years. Every year builds on the previous year. Also, in 2018, my father and I did a short mini-series on prayer, and that was entitled, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? And we dealt with the specific kind of prayer, but then in that series, we briefly dealt with the other types of prayer. So if you'll watch or listen to those messages, they will be a help, they will be a blessing to you. Now, before we start covering new ground, I want to remind you of the various types of prayer. It's not a one-fit-all approach. In the New Testament, in the Bible, there are various types of prayer, and so you have to use the right type of prayer for the right situation. And a lot of believers, they don't know that. There's the prayer of faith, which is the prayer of petition to change things. There is a prayer of consecration, and that is a prayer of consecration or dedication. And it's in the prayer of consecration that we pray, if it be thy will. Now, there are a lot of believers and they pray, if it be thy will, in every prayer, which is not correct. And that's why they don't get the answers thereafter. And so that's why I would encourage you to go back to 2018 and listen to or watch that series, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? There's the prayer of commitment, which is the prayer of casting every care, every anxiety, every worry upon God. There's the prayer of worship, and that's when we gather as believers and we pray and sing, worshiping God with joy and gratitude and thanksgiving. There's the prayer of agreement, and that is when two or more believers stand and pray in agreement together. And for that prayer to work, they actually have to be in agreement. We'll deal with that later this week. There's prayer in the Spirit, which is prayer in tongues by the utterance of the Holy Spirit. Then there is united or corporate prayer, and that's when believers gather together to pray for the church or for a pressing need or a situation the church faces. And then there's the prayer of supplication. And that's when we make a humble, heartfelt, earnest request unto God for ourselves, for other believers, or for labors to be sent forth. 
And then finally, there is intercessory prayer. And that's when we as believers stand in the gap for someone, a loved one, for someone we know, maybe someone in the church family. It's when we pray, as I've asked you to do, for our nation and for the leaders in our nation. And so in these days, yes, it's fine to pray for your needs. It's fine to pray regarding your family. All of that's fine. But we also need to be engaging in intercessory prayer for America, for our nation, for our leaders, and for revival in America. Now, if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, John 15 and verse 7. John 15 and verse 7, Jesus said, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given unto you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever, and what does that word mean? It means whatever, and we'll deal with that. Ask whatever you wish and it will be. Not it might Nah, not it could be, not if everything is aligned just perfectly, it will be given unto you. Now what does it mean to remain or to abide? It means to live in, to settle down in, to take up residence in your life. That's what it means to abide or to remain. For the word of God to live in, to settle down in, to take up residence in you. So we could read John 15 and verse seven this way. If you live in, settle down in, take up residence in Christ, and if his words, if his word lives in, settles down in, and take up, takes up residence in you, then you can ask whatever you wish, and it will be given unto you. So first we deal with this reality that we cannot successfully ask for whatever we wish if we're not remaining in him, and his word is not remaining in us. And this is one reason why there are many believers and they, they couldn't tell you the last answer to prayer they had. You know, pastors encouraged us for more than a year and a half to keep a list of our answers to prayer, our testimonies, and it is amazing what God has done. But that's not the reality for many believers. And why is that? Well, they're not remaining in Christ and his word is not remaining in him. What, what they're doing is they, they just live any way they want to because at some point, someone told them the lie that grace means you can live however you want. You can even live in sin and it's okay. And so they believe that lie. So they're living however they want. And then they pray when there's an emergency. They pray when they get jammed up. And when they pray, their heart condemns them. They don't pray in faith. They, don't, they pray in unbelief and in doubt. And then that's why they don't get an answer. They're not remaining in him and his word is not remaining in them, and so they can't ask for whatever they wish, and it be given unto them. So this explains why there are so many believers, and they don't get their prayers answered. And this is also why so many believers, they're, they're, they're miserable and happy people. You know, as the children of God, we ought to be happy. We ought to be joyful, and Jesus said elsewhere that we could ask and receive, and our joy would be complete. But there, there are believers and they, they don't know how to pray. They don't know the keys to prayer. So they're not getting the answers they're after and they're, they're not happy. They're not joyful. But there is a way to pray. There is a way to get answers and results when you pray. There is a way to pray and to be heard and to be answered every time. So you have to evaluate in your life, not, not your husband or wife, not your children, not, not your coworkers, not someone you know at church, in your life, you have to evaluate your abiding factor. Your abiding factor, and what is that? It is the extent to which you, in your life, every day, are remaining in Christ, and the extent to which every day, His Word remains in you. John 15, verse seven, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given unto you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing. Another word we could use is proving. Proving yourselves to be my disciples. So first, to have a successful prayer life, you've got to remain in Christ. And His Word, the Word of God, has to remain in you, in your heart and in your life. And that requires daily Bible reading and daily fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And for some of us, we've been told to be at home. So we have more time to spend in the Word 
and more time to spend in prayer. You know, there's nothing wrong with entertainment. There is a time and a place for entertainment, but entertainment is not going to result in our prayers being answered. And so the answer is more time in the Word and more time in prayer. And that time, that quality time you spend with God in prayer and in the Word of God, that is your abiding factor. And in these days, our abiding factor ought to be going up and not down. On our website and also on the church's app, we've got the daily Bible reading. I would encourage you to start with that. Don't, don't forget either the success formula that God gave Joshua, Joshua 1.8. Do not let this book of the law, do not let my word depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So not uh, once a week, not once a month, not once a year on uh, Easter or on Palm Sunday. Meditate on it, my word, day and night. So you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Psalm 119, 105 tells us that the word of God, it is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Why are there so many Christians and they, they stumble constantly? You turn on Christian radio and they're talking about it's just another day of struggle, another day of difficulty, and they would have you believe that they, they live their whole life stumbling and going from difficulty to difficulty and from trouble to trouble. Why is that? It's because they're living their life in the dark. They're not living their life in the light of the Word of God. The Bible says that God's Word, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I've given the example of how in our house we've got small children and they've got a bunch of little toys. And yes, we ask them to clean up, but the reality is everything is not cleaned up at every moment of every day. And there have been times early in the morning and I've been walking around the living room in our house praying and I step on a Lego or a transformer or whatever it is and it hurts. Why? Well, the lights are out. I don't want to wake anybody up because once they hear me, once they're up, they're up and it's time to go for the day. But when do people stumble? When do people get into trouble? When do people stub their toe? It's when they're walking around in the dark. And that's what many people do spiritually when they're not living their life in the light of the Word of God. John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be given unto you. It will be given unto you. Second, when you remain or abide in Christ and His Word remains or abides in you, you can ask God for anything that is consistent with the Word of God and with a godly life. Again, as we'll learn later this week, to get answers when we pray, our hearts, can't, con they can't condemn us. And so if in your life you're asking for something that is out of line with the Word of God, your heart will condemn you. Or if you know in your heart you're not really living for God the way you should be with all your heart, soul, and mind, your heart will condemn you. So second, when we remain or abide in Him and His Word remains or abides in us, we can ask for whatever we wish as long as it is consistent with the Word of God and with a godly life, with a godly lifestyle. Third, we see that we are to bear much good fruit in our prayer lives. We are to bear much good fruit in our prayer lives. There's a saying in the world that the, the fruit, the proof is in the pudding. And we have to live mindful of that fact, that reality. You might wonder what I'm doing. I'm looking at my list to answer prayer since we started keeping track for the past 20 months, Jessica and I have had 142 answers to prayer, 142 personal testimonies, 142 personal miracles of an answer to prayer or the provision of God, 142 in just 20 months. There is a way that works. There is a way to pray and get results. There is a way to pray and to get answers. And that's what we're learning this week in these noon sessions on prayer. How to pray and to get answers. How to pray and for your, your time in prayer to not be wasted, for your time in prayer to be productive. 
So third, we see that we are to bear much good fruit in our prayer lives. John 15, verse 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Verse 8, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And you might say that to yourself at home or wherever you are, much fruit. That you bear much fruit showing or proving. Again, that saying in the world, the, the proof is in the pudding, proving yourselves to be my disciples. Answered prayer is one type of good fruit. Answered prayer is one type of good fruit. And there are believers, and they would say they love God, they love the Word of God, they love the, they love the house of God, but there is not fruit in their lives. There is not good fruit in their lives. And if you ask them, well, what was the last prayer God answered, they couldn't tell you. They couldn't answer you. If you ask them to tell you a testimony, they, they couldn't answer you. Answered prayer is one type of good fruit. And answered prayer is evidence that we are truly followers of Christ. Answered prayer is evidence that we are truly followers of Christ, that we live the life Jesus is talking about here, that we remain in Him, and His, His Word remains in us. Good or bad, Jesus said that people are known by their fruit. Turn in your Bible to Matthew 7, Matthew 7 beginning in verse 16, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And Jesus dealt with this in other parables. Our focus in our lives should be on this. How can I bear good fruit? How can I bear more good fruit for the kingdom of God? And in prayer specifically, how can I pray more effectively? How can I pray to get answers? How can I pray to see the hand of God move, not just in my life, but in my family, in my church, in the nation? But how can I bear good fruit and much good fruit in my prayer life? Again, the world has a saying, the proof is in the pudding. And so this should be true in our lives as Christians, and this also should be true in our prayer lives. Verse 16, here in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last then. And I would, I would mark that. I would underline that. I would highlight that in your Bible. Then my, the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Then. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last then. I would mark that, I would highlight that, I would underline that. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Fruit, good fruit, is a prerequisite, a requirement for answered prayer. And you might say, oh, Austin, do you mean to tell me that if there's sin in my life, I'm not going to get prayers answered like you're getting prayers answered? Yes. You might say, Austin, do you mean to tell me if there are areas of my life that the Holy Spirit has convicted me about and uh, I've not obeyed, I've not repented, I've not gotten with it, that that'll hinder my prayers? Yes. And we'll, we'll deal with this more. To, if you want answers to prayer, you got to live the life. And you've got to produce good fruit in every area of your life. Otherwise, your prayers will be short-circuited. It would be like trying to charge your phone without plugging your phone in. It's not going to work. Fruit, good fruit, in living the Christian life, it is a prerequisite. It is a requirement for answered prayer. Fruit, good fruit, is a prerequisite, a requirement for being able to ask for whatever you want or desire as long as it is consistent with a godly life lived in light of the Word of God. It's a requirement. Answered prayer is a natural byproduct of a genuine Christian life. You know, there are, there are people, and when they pray, they get answers. And it's the same people who genuinely live the Christian life. If you want to be heard by God, you've got to live the life. 
You got to walk with God. And not just once or twice a year, not just when there is trouble, but you've got to walk with God at all times. Why are there so many believers and their prayer lacks power? Why do the prayers of so many believers go unheard and unanswered? It's because they're not bearing good fruit. They're not genuinely living the Christian life. They don't bear good fruit in their lives. And so when they pray, they know that and their heart condemns them and their prayers, the power of it, it is short circuited. Let's reread John 15 and verse 16 this way. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last then. Another way we could say this is then and only then. You know, it's amazing how many times in the Bible you have the word if. It's amazing how many times in the Bible you have the word then. And so read it this way. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last then. We could say then and only then will the Father give you whatever you ask in my name. Then. Then and only then. So if you want your prayers answered, if you want to be able to ask God for whatever you want or desire that is consistent with the Word of God and with the godly life, then you have to live a life of good fruit. You've got to produce good fruit and much good fruit in your everyday life. A fruitful Christian life is a requirement for a fruitful prayer life. A fruitful Christian life is a requirement for a fruitful prayer life. And as we've learned, if you want power with God when you pray, if you want answers when you pray, if you want to be able to ask for whatever you wish, you've got to have good fruit in your life. Let's read John 15, 16 one more time. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Then, then and only then. So as you're watching or as you're listening, Maybe you're not watching this live or listening live. Maybe you'll watch or listen to this later. But if there are areas of your life God has been dealing with you about, repent, make them right, line those areas of your life up with the Word of God, begin doing what's right. And as you do that, as you begin bearing good fruit in those areas of your life, you'll discover that your prayer has greater power and you'll be heard and you'll be answered. And then you'll be given what you're asking for in prayer. As we learned and as I mentioned when we started today, there are many types of prayer and you have to pray the right type of prayer for whatever it is you're praying about. You've got to pray the right type of prayer for whatever situation you're facing. And as an example, many people pray, if it be thy will in every prayer, and then they wonder why they're not heard. They wonder why they're not answered. You know, right now, because of what's going on in our nation, say you worked in an area that was affected and say temporarily you were laid off. You, you don't have to pray about it being God's will for you to look for a job. The Bible says that if a man will not work, he should not eat. God wants you to have a job. God wants you to be busy. God wants you to be employed. And so if you're in a situation where you need to look for work in another field or another area or another job, you, you don't have to pray about whether or not that's the Lord's will. You don't have to pray about whether or not it's the Lord's will you be nice to your wife or nice to your husband. See, people do that and it sounds so spiritual, but it is powerless and God doesn't hear it and God doesn't answer it. Yeah, sure, there are times when it is appropriate to pray the prayer of consecration. But you know what I'm talking about. There are people and they use that because they think it seems so spiritual. They, they pray, if it be thy will about everything. And they're one of those people and they don't have good fruit in their lives. They're one of those people. They couldn't tell you the last prayer that was answered, the last testimony they had, the last miracle they had. So again, Whatever you're praying about, whatever you're facing, you've got to pray the right type of prayer. Ephesians 6 and verse 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. You might say, Austin, prayer in the Spirit. I'll deal with that later this week. But at the end of the day's session on prayer, 
I'll give you the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior if you've not already done that. And I'll also pray with you if you have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit so you can pray in the Spirit. But right now I want to focus on what Paul says. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You got to pray the right type of prayer for whatever it is you're praying about or the situation you're facing. One, another example, I gave you the example of people praying, if it be thy will, in every prayer. Another example is the prayer of agreement. For the prayer of agreement to work, you actually have to be in agreement. You've heard my father say that, yes, we believe in faith, and yes, we believe that God heals, but at the same time, we're also not the faith police. And everybody's got to believe God at their level. And so if there's someone and they're, they're praying, they're believing that they're going to have a procedure and that it go well, that, that's where we stand in faith and agreement with them. For the prayer of agreement to work, you actually have to be in agreement. But you might have someone else and they're, they're, they're at a higher level of faith and their prayer is that they won't need a procedure. They won't need a surgery. And then we stand in faith and agreement with them at that level. We're not the faith police. We're to encourage one another and we're to stand in faith together wherever someone is at in their walk with the Lord. But for the prayer of agreement to work, you actually have to be in agreement. People also act as if God's will is mysterious. God's will is not mysterious. We know his will by his word. And so if something is a mystery to you, Whatever it is, you've just got to open the Bible and find out what God has said about it. We know his will by his word. It is not a mystery. So in your life, whatever the need, whatever the situation, whatever the request, whatever you're praying about, you've got to get into the word of God and you've got to find out what the word says. So that way it won't be a mystery. As my father said yesterday, I believe last night, whatever it is you're believing for, Whatever it is you're praying about, you've got to get into the Word of God and find out what you are authorized to believe God for. So whatever you're praying for, whatever you're praying about, know what you want from God and find two, even better, find three scriptures that promise what you desire. Know what you want from God and find two or three scriptures that cover your situation. Then fix those scriptures in your heart and mind. Pray them daily. Confess them daily. Meditate on the promises of God's word daily. And then when your mind is filled with doubt or worry, or when you watch the news and become concerned, or you, you, share, you see some nutty thing someone shared on Facebook that isn't true, or you get some t alarmist text message that's bogus or whatever it is, or when Satan tries to tempt you or when Satan tries to fill your mind with doubt and unbelief, use the scriptures you found to fight the good fight of faith. Don't let anyone or anything, don't let anyone, not even Satan, talk you out of the promises of God's word. How did Satan deceive Adam and Eve? Look in your Bible at Genesis 3 and verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? In your life, if there is someone in your life and they're saying, did God really say? They're, they're questioning, they're, they're picking things apart. You know, you, you tell them about what you're believing God for and what the word of God says. And they, they say, well, did God really say? That's the voice of Satan. And he's not changed. He operates the same way today. That's what he said to Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Satan went on to misquote Father God. He twisted the words of Father God. Did God really say? And that's how Satan deceives believers today. That's how Satan talks believers today out of all the promises and the blessings of God. You tell someone you can be healed. You tell someone that Jesus said we can lay our hands on the sick and they'll recover. You tell someone what James said that we can anoint the sick with oil and pray the prayer of faith and they will be forgiven and raised up. But then they start saying, did God really say? And so because of that, they miss out on God's best. They miss out on God's blessings, his benefits. How do you run Satan off? 
How do you deal with thoughts that are of the enemy? How do you deal with doubt and unbelief and thoughts of doubt and unbelief? You've got to do what Jesus did when Satan tempted him. You've got to declare with your mouth what the Word of God says. You've got to open your mouth and declare what the Word of God says. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. And he was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted of the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written. And of course, in his day, the scripture they had was what we call the Old Testament. So Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. And there he quoted Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. So Jesus responded to Satan with the word. Verse 5, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. And you might say, well, how did Satan have that right? It's because Adam in the Garden of Eden handed his authority, his dominion, over to Satan. That's why Paul calls Satan the little G-O-D, the little God of this world. So Satan said to Jesus, it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Verse 7, so if you worship me, it will all be yours. Verse 8, Jesus answered, again, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And there he quoted Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now notice here, Satan quoted the Bible. Who knows the Bible better than you might? Satan. And he twists it, he deceives, he distorts what the Word of God says, he takes it out of context to lead people astray, or as he said to Eve, as he still says to people today, did God really say? Now notice again how Jesus responded. Verse 12, Jesus answered, it says. What says? The Word of God says. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And there, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left Jesus until an opportune time. Some translations say a more opportune time. So how did Jesus respond to temptation? How did Jesus respond to the lies of the enemy? He said, it is written. He declared with his mouth what the word of God said. And they didn't have little pocket miniature Bibles back then. He didn't have a little pocket miniature Old Testament with him. How was he able to say it is written? Because he had done what God told Joshua. He had meditated on the word of God until he had the word of God in his heart. And that way, when Satan showed up, he could then have the word of God coming out of his mouth. So that's why, as I said, you've got to turn some things off and you've got to tune into the word of God and you got to get the fear out, the doubt out, the unbelief out, and fill your heart with faith so you can say what God's Word says and so you can also pray what God's Word says. That's where the victory is. That's where the power is. So whatever the need in your life is, whatever you're praying about, find two or three scriptures that promise what you desire. Find two or three scriptures that cover your situation. Fix those scriptures in your heart and your mind. Pray them daily, confess them daily, meditate on them daily. And then when someone says some negative thing or there's a thought of doubt and unbelief or Satan shows up and he says, did God really say? Use those scriptures, confess them, declare them. Be like Jesus and say, no, that can't be true. That temptation can't be true for the Bible says it is written. You know, in these times we live in, a fear, a lie, a deception of the enemy is that we're not going to have enough or we're going to go backwards or a need is not going to be met or a bill is not going to be paid. So when that lie comes, when that thought comes, 
that thought of unbelief, you've got to say and declare what the Word of God says. No, that cannot be true because Philippians 4.19 says, my God shall supply all of my needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The power is to say what God's Word says, and the power is to pray what God's Word says. So use the scriptures you find to fight the good fight of faith, and do that until you have your answer. Do that until you have your victory. 2 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 3 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought, every thought, to make it obedient to Christ. How do you take captive wrong thoughts? How do you take captive thoughts of doubt and unbelief? How do you take captive temptations that come to the mind by saying and declaring what God's Word says. And you've got to open up your mouth and you've got to say what the Word of God says. And when you say what the Word of God says, you'll run doubt off every time. You'll run unbelief off every time. You'll run Satan off every time. You've got to say what the Word says. You can have the victory even in your thought life. You might be saying, Austin, man, these are some high standards. Are you saying my, my thought life matters? Well, do you want your prayers answered? When you pray, do you want to be heard? Do you want to be answered? You got to fly straight. You got to live a life that is wholeheartedly surrendered unto God. Jesus dealt with our thought life in the Sermon on the Mount. You've got to live in such a way that your heart does not condemn you. You've got to live in such a way that you're bearing good fruit in your life so that when you go to your heavenly Father in prayer in the name of Jesus, He sees you're, you're living a life of good fruit. He sees you're coming to Him in faith. He sees that not only because of what Jesus did has He given you the righteousness of God in Christ, He sees that you're actually living life as the righteousness of God in Christ. And when you get everything lined up, that's when you'll have great power in your prayer life. That's when you'll have great victory in your prayer life. That's when, when you open your mouth and pray and make a request, heaven will hear, God will hear, God will answer. That's when even when you open your mouth and just declare something or say something, that your words will not fall to the ground, but they will come to pass in your life. You can live a life of victory. You can live a life of victory in your prayer life. And this week, we're going to deal with how you can do just that and how you can get there.